I, uh, many years ago, uh, and I, uh, many years ago I was introduced to the Baha'i Faith, and there's no way for me to tell you about my deepest near-death experience without relating it to the Baha'i Faith. I often think it has a great deal to do with why I had the uh, particular experience, but uh, years ago when I was uh, 13, I went to my first Baha'i Fireside. A Baha'i Fireside is a very informal gathering. Uh, we Baha'is have no paid clergy. clergy. We uh, have no, no ritual, no formalized ritual. Um, but a fireside is a discussion group in which people are invited to hear the basic teachings of the Baha'i faith and discuss them uh, if they decide to. Um, and at this fireside, I felt very much a great sense of hope and promise. I had been raised uh, a, a Christian, although I indeed had some American Indian spiritual uh, uh, teachings from my mother, um, but I had been raised primarily as a, as a formalized Christian. I went through an unusual period of health in my life uh, from that period on, from the age of 13, and then suddenly one day at the age of 16, um, I woke up one morning and I was uh, terribly swollen and blistered with, a, with an allergic reaction and was having difficulty breathing. Uh, my mother took me to the doctor and he administered uh, d d cortisone and d allergy shots and histamines and I improved and we went home. And. Uh, uh, stayed home that day. My father was uh, away on a trip and uh, in the evening my mother uh, were sitting down to dinner and a friend stopped by, high school friend, and he joined us and I began to realize as we're sitting around our table that I was being pulled away as if my heart were a piece of taffy and it were being stretched away from my body. And this was a wonderful feeling. This was not disturbing to me in any way, but I thought I knew I would, was going to pass out. So I suddenly stood to tell my mother and, and my friend Jerry I, I was going to black out, and I said, I'm going to black out, and I immediately blacked out. And they then uh, checked me and realized that my breathing was, was terribly irregular and that the allergic reaction was really escalating suddenly. And they decided to load me in the car. Um, my consciousness, I have no conscious memory of this, my mother uh, filled in these details. They uh, <clears throat> then carried me out to the car, loaded me in the back seat of the car and began to drive to the hospital, but by the time they, we had a long, steep driveway, by the time they got to the bottom of the driveway, they realized that I was not breathing at all properly, and that neither of them could administer mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. They flagged down a policeman um, who then uh, radioed for the fire department and for an ambulance, and they, they pulled me out of the car and uh, uh, laid the body on the sidewalk. This was a small town, which was at that point in time a, a relatively uh, a rural area. They laid me out on the sidewalk, and my memory is, is next of hearing uh, the fire engine coming down the street. And I heard the fire engine and the fireman's boots get uh, shuffling around me and I heard the people around me because all of a sudden a crowd had gathered of my neighbors and, and my friends who came to see what the commotion was about. And, uh, and the fireman immediately went to, to, to work on my body. And I heard people calling to me, Renee, my best friend was calling to me. I had gone through elementary school with her and into junior high and she was calling to me, Renee, don't die, don't die. And suddenly the idea hit me and it seemed bizarre. When you're 16, you don't die. You don't suddenly die. But I realized I had a responsibility because I loved my friend and my mother to fight for my life. And I fought. I tried to will my heart to beat. 
I tried to keep my body going because I didn't want them to be hurt. But I realized it was too insurmountable of a struggle. It was just impossible. And the uh, uh, next thing I became aware of was that it was as if my life force were drawing up out of my limbs to a place around my heart. And in that place, this is the first stage of the near-death experience, a stage in which people report incredible peace. There's a great sense of peace and surrender. When I simply gave up the struggle and let it be, there was this great comforting darkness and surrender. And then, in an instant, and this makes no sense in physical terms, then in an instant, <laughs> thank you, canes are always doing awkward things, then in an instant like this, it was like a clap. I, my consciousness was outside my body and it was as if I were a ball of light about this high in the midst of the crowd and I was it was as if I were not just conscious I was massively conscious it was as if by comparison I had never been conscious before and I was pummeled with this tremendous input of all of the emotion and turmoil and, and, and drama of every individual in that crowd and I was feeling their feelings as if I were the, them and as if I were myself. Everything that they were feeling and thinking and knowing I, I was completely aware of. And I followed their attention to a thing on the sidewalk. And I looked at that. The firemen were now straddling me. Uh, one was on one side trying to monitor the pulse and the other one was they had been administering oxygen. Now, oxygen, now they were giving me uh, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. This was pre-paramedics. I followed their attention to this thing on the sidewalk and looked at the curve of the wrist and I recognized it as my wrist and I was horrified and appalled that that thing on the sidewalk was something that I had identified as myself all my life. That I had identified that as me. Because now, suddenly, it was nothing more than a, a blistered and, and bloated piece of meat. It was just a thing on the sidewalk. And for me to ever have considered that to have been my true self was, was repulsive to me. And immediately with that repulsion and with my pain at feeling my mother's sort of pre-oral grief, I bumped up again in a rapid uh, uh, movement to a place above some wires. The wires were on a street light. Interestingly enough, m m years ago when we did the 2020 section, uh, they actually had a crane and took me up there to see if I could actually physically see what I thought I could physically see. Uh, see, although I had no eyes, but indeed I could. But from this point of view, my concern was for the people on the sidewalk. My concern was for my mother and her grief and my friends and the firemen who didn't want to lose me, who felt responsible. I seemed to be aware that one had a teenage daughter and uh, didn't feel like he could turn and face my mother and tell her that they had lost me. My, and my concern was for a neighbor child that was coming out of a house and he was going to walk down his driveway and see me on the sidewalk. And I love this child. I didn't want him to see this body and think of that as being death. And I didn't want him to think that that, that was me. I wanted him to know that I was free, that it was wonderful, that I was suddenly and, and massively alive compared to what I had ever been. So I was calling to my friends and to my mother and to the child's mother to please go and get this little boy so he wouldn't see me. And I was calling to them that everything is as it should be, that it was wonderful, that I was free, and that I loved them. And I realized that I had no mouth, no voice, 
that I had no place here in this physical realm anymore. And I called upon God to help me, to guide me. And with that, my consciousness turned away from the crowd. And this Now I'm, please, I ask you to understand that the near-death experience, any person who tries to talk about it really um, is taking on an impossible task. I, I think uh, there's just no way to talk about it because all of our words are imbued with physical reality. All of our thoughts and our conceptions are imbued with, uh, with uh, developed in a, in a place in which there's time and space and in which we can only come to an understanding of things gradually and in which we can only walk across the floor by taking one step after another. And all of those things relate to the physical reality. And I was in a realm of reality in which there was no time and in which there was no space and in which there was no limitation that we experience in this reality. And so therefore, any words that I use, uh, I ask you to please understand, don't relate to the physical words. To see does not mean to see with physical eyes. To hear and to know does not mean to know in the way that we know physically. And as I pulled up away from the scene on the sidewalk, again, I was consciously aware of moving up and what was beneath me, which is physically impossible. And I saw this one little place on the sidewalk, it's smaller and smaller, and a little valley in which it existed, and a little town, a city, and pulled way, way up until a point to where I saw the earth as a single living organic whole. And this was wonderful. This was so uh, uh, wonderful to me that I was, I was overcome by the beauty of it because I could see and feel and beat with the same heart as every individual that was living on this planet, as every amoeba that was swimming in the ocean. Uh, I could feel and hear the notes of this wonderful, grand, universal song that enveloped the whole earth. And I saw that we as individuals as human beings, as human spirits existing in bodies, have a unique creative capacity on this plane of existence. And what makes us creative and very powerful is really the tone of our hearts. Not what we do, not what we owned, not what we know, but really the tone of our hearts permeates the stuff of all physical existence. And I saw this and felt this immediately. And I felt that nothing, and I knew, nothing exists without a purpose or without a note to sing in this grand, single, universal symphony. And I began to sing my note. I began to sing, really, I am. That's the only words I can use. But it wasn't I am in the, in the sense of self. It was an I am. I am one and of you. I love you. I am connected to all of you. And in harmony with all of you. And this is an expression of, of love and an expression of the divinity of all creation. From that point, I was aware that there was a light that was permeating and shining from the hearts of people, from individuals, and that permeated the whole planet. And I began to move towards that light, and I moved into a place that people report to be the tunnel. To me, it was simply a place of transition. It was as if there was a great amount of energy that was funneled into a, a narrow space and it was a place of transition and there were people there that didn't seem to know what they were or who they are who did seem to be confused and, and lost and dark 
And I moved through this place, and I realized what moved me through this place was not what moves us physically. You know, when we move physically, we have an intent, and then we decide to take an action. We express that physically. What I found moved me through the tunnel was not an intent, not a decision, not a will, certainly not a physical being because I was no longer a physical being. I was literally uh, energy. But what moved me was love. And this was the love of all loves, the greatest of loves that moved me. And the sooner, the quicker I moved, the more love I felt. Do you know, we have a hidden word in the Baha'i faith. This is one of the writings of Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah, by the way, means the glory of God. And he speaks with the voice of God. He says, love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can in no wise reach thee. Know this, O servant. So what moved me through this place of transition where people were, some people were not moving, was the great love that I had for the love of all loves, for the love of all beauties. Um, to me, the, the love of God. And as I moved through this, I wondered, as I came to the end of it, if I would be alone. And then instantly, though the, the thought and the reality were one and the same, instantly I was merged with an uncle of mine who had passed on a year before, a year and a half before. And instantly I was everything that he was, and he was everything that I was and knew. and and. And I was aware of things that I couldn't have been aware of in this life uh, about my uncle. It was a very joyous reunion. It was as if we were two lights that had come together and blended as a single light. And I became aware that he was a person of great courage. Although to look at him in this life, he was obviously a very impressive, very tall, regal looking uh, 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 individual um, with the classic, you know, Native American features and, and, and whatnot. And he was a very humble, uh, uh, although he was educated and whatnot, he was a very humble persona, but I realized that he was a person of tremendous courage and that this courage was was very uh, almost unspeakably great in him and, and it was not something that one could ever judge physically in this life looking at the way that he lived his life one wouldn't say that he was a courageous person but I realized that he was one of the great heroes um, sometime later my mother explained something to me that I wasn't aware of that makes sense to me now but as well, though this was very joyous, this this union with my uncle, to all to instantly be aware of everything that he was and knew and, and could be spiritually and intellectually and emotionally, um, my attraction really was for the love of all loves, for this great magnetic pull that I felt, and I moved through him. And I became aware also that he was quite shocked that I was there because my mother could not endure my death at that point in time. But I also knew that everything was as it should be. I moved into what appeared to be a, a sea of light. It was as if every atom or molecule in this room had been electrified with love with creative and very powerful love. We think of love as being something not powerful, but this love, I realized, was the greatest force of all things. And it was as if every atom were an individual and were singing and was, was welcoming me and uh, was full of love. And yet I was more and more attracted to what I perceived to be the center of the sea of light. 
It was as if in the, in the center of the sea there was a sun. And my heart was just irresistibly attracted to that. And again, in an instant, with a tremendous clash, not clash, but in, in, in a tremendous and in, in magnificent instant, I entered this this center of the sea of light, this, this sun in, in, in the sea, the light, the heart of the light. And it was as if I were devastated. It was as if I were, you know, just spider silk in the solar wind. I was completely devastated by bliss and by rapture and by ecstasy. And yet I was not. I was simply in and of and because of that light, and yet I was, as an individual, destroyed. It was as if I were the quintessential phoenix. And it seemed that I was in that non-place, that place of non-being as an individual, for forever. <laughs> and then yet again, my consciousness at some point was gathered back together as an individual like like uh, sands upon a shore into an individual form and I was accompanied now by a presence as opposed to simply being devastated by this holy storm of light and I was called to recount for the deeds of my life And this recounting for the deeds of one's life is not like we would think at all in terms of this life. Because what was important were the choices that I made. And what was more important than, than just the choices that I made were my motivations and my intents and really the state of my heart in doing any single action. And I realized in this, because I experienced sort of in a holographic uh, the awareness that was rather instantaneous, how every action that one takes is like a stone cast in the water. And if it's loving, that stone you know, is cast in the water and the loving action goes out and touches the first person that it's intended for and then it touches another person and then it touches another person because that person interacts with other people and so on and so on. And every action has a reverberating effect upon every single one of us on the face of this planet. So if I had committed a loving action it was like love upon love upon light. A, lo a loving, a purely loving action was the most wonderful thing that I could ever have achieved in my life. This had more meaning than to have been a Rockefeller or president of the United States or to have been, you know, a, a great scientist and to have invented something just incredible. If I had committed a truly pure and loving action, it had reverberated throughout the stuff of every individual in that planet, and I felt their, that action reverberating through them and through myself. And I felt it in a way that uh, is beyond what we can even feel ourselves on this plane of existence. So, um, the significance of one's actions totally changed. What was not important was anything that I had, you know, owned or, 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 or known intellectual, you know, there's a sense of intellectual pride, not that knowledge is bad, knowledge is good, but, but it, what was important was the purity and the motivation of every action. And I recall the most important of my actions is an instant I would never have recalled except for the near-death experience. And that's that many years ago. Um, I had worked every summer as a, as a volunteer with retarded children. There was a day camp 
that went on, and I spent all summer going every day, eight hours a day, to the state camp. And there was a, a child uh, one time. Uh, it wasn't as if I were being rewarded for taking good actions, you know, like writing down actions. Well, I have done this good and that good and that good. No, what, what was important was, again, the motivation and the purity and the sincerity of my acts. And I had taken a child aside on a very hot day, and this was not a charming or a particularly lovable child. But I wanted this child to feel loved. I wanted this child to feel really the love of God that brought him into existence and that brought us all into existence. And I took him aside, although I wasn't religiously motivated, you know, formally. I just wanted him to feel love. I took him aside and, and uh, sang to him and gave him something to drink and just spent some time with him. And he was very agitated, but I just wanted him to feel that, that love. And that was the greatest of all actions. And that filled me with just unspeakable an incomprehensible joy. And it was not an action that anyone noticed. And it was not an action that I even recalled. And it was not an action that I had done with any thought of reward. It was simply an action motivated by love, by selfless love. And this had great meaning. In this context, one becomes aware that, you know, judgment is not necessarily imposed from the outside, but there was a judgment that was born of the sense of mine own knowledge. Suddenly I had a point of reference. Suddenly I realized that it was love that had brought me into existence on this plane of existence. It was love that had guided me through every instant of my life. It was really a, a love that had accompanied me uh, uh, throughout my whole life and accompanied every individual throughout my whole life. And really there was nothing that I could have done to have been worthy of that love, that unspeakable, incomprehensible, um, immeasurable, love that I realized that I was receiving that, and that all individuals were receiving. So if to, to have committed any act of love was the greatest joy and the greatest wonder and the greatest achievement. And to have committed any act that was selfish and that was in any way cruel, you can imagine the impact of that act reverberating throughout the stuff of all existence and all individuals. This would be the uh, sense of great uh, uh, turmoil and pain and, uh, and the one, one would rather die than to have committed such an act. But the time of my life was spent. At that point I, I uh, was taken by the being who was accompanying me and was shown a point of reference of the body on the sidewalk. I'm sorry, I was taken to, to see an answer to a question which was really a question of my heart, not of my mind. It was a concern of my heart. I had wondered where we were going as humankind. I wondered what was going to happen to us as a child because I had been uh, quite ill as a child and uh, I began reading newspapers very early. I began reading everything that I could read because this was my, my real contact uh, uh, with the world and I became very aware that we lived in a world that was uh, existing on the precipice of great destruction and we lived in a world that was hopelessly and, and, and terribly lost and I was very worried about the state of mankind. And so this being again showed me in a, in a holographic sense, in a way that we can't perceive in this plane of existence, um, really the development 
of humankind from the beginning of time until some point in the future. I'm not the first person to report this, by the way. But I perceived as an archetypal individual uh, the stages of our development sort of uh, I felt uh, the Neanderthal and how brutish and dark and and needy and and self-centered you know that particular level of ex existence was and I uh, felt the conniving sort of politicality of the Romans who thought they were all powerful in the days of uh, of Christ and I felt uh, the great surge of hope around the, the development of the scientific and, uh, revolution, really, of the, of the Renaissance. And uh, I, I became aware that uh, we now existed on the precipice of the greatest choice that, and the greatest step in our development and evolution that had ever occurred on the face of the planet. We as a human race existed at this point and that we had to make the choice as individuals and as a people to establish unity and peace and harmony on the face of this planet. And I saw then that there was a small group of people who I identified, who I knew were the just. This was a title in words. These people were the just, and they were working diligently, striving uh, to bring about really a new civilization and a new creation on the planet. And they were working to bring about peace and unity and this great spiritual development that we need at this point in time. And these people were not powerful and they were not wealthy and they did not have tremendous institutions. They were, they were young and struggling and in the process of their struggling and in their building a new civilization simultaneously with this wonderful process, there was a great chaos and destruction going on in the world. And these things interest, you know, this happened to me in 1960. I'm really bad with years. 1966. Uh, uh, and these things don't sound bizarre anymore, but they, they did at that point in time, and certainly for many years after. But simultaneously with this development of a new civilization and a new spiritual reality, a new way of being that was the hope of the people of the world, was great destruction, was great chaos, was a great breakdown in all of our institutions and systems in the educational and the governmental and the uh, religious and the intellectual and the scientific and all of the institutions that we see as being revered and important. All of these things were breaking down to the point that there were just rather ravening bands of wolves as people that were roving the streets that were just filled with hatred that were just filled with selfishness and, 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 uh, uh, and darkness. And there was a great sense of polarization of the people where, where people were saying, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an Indian and you're white and I don't relate to whites and I don't relate to Hispanics and I don't relate to, you know, Jewish people and I don't relate to Buddhist people. There was this great sense of polarization so that it's, it went to the point to where every religion was fighting every other religion on the face of this planet, which is indeed happening today, except for the religion of the just. And I saw then that there was a place that was the hope and this was in a land that was very old and very new. It was in a land that had great history and that faced the Mediterranean. And there was a, a, a wonderful white marble building set high atop a, a, a holy mountain. And I was looking out from the building and I could see that both men and women were receiving 
these teachings and this guidance and these were equals, these were not separate in any way. And I could see that that was the hope of mankind. And then I turned to the being. I'll explain to you more about that building later. I turned to the being who was accompanying me and suddenly he coalesced into an individual instead of being a, a great holy presence of, of incomprehensible light. He coalesced into an individual presence of, of incomprehensible light. He coalesced into an individual and I recognized him as that individual that I had seen before. And immediately as I had seen before after my first Baha'i Fireside when I was 13, I immediately only wanted to die in his presence, to stop existing because I was of no significance whatsoever. In, in this presence. I had no meaning, just no, no worth. My only worth was simply to uh, lay down my, myself, my life, at his feet. And again, as had happened those years previous, he turned to me and in a very magnanimous and loving and regal and, and generous gesture he extended his arm to me in a very graceful, powerful way and said, Here am I. Here am I. And it seemed again that I was in his presence for a time beyond time. And that was the apex of all that I had ever hoped for, of all that I had ever dreamed of, of all that I had ever desired in any instant of my life was to be nothing in this beautiful presence, in the present beauty. He was, I knew, the blessed perfection. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that. And I knew that I was excruciatingly blessed that this was just a, a bounty and a blessing beyond desert or beyond anything I could ever have earned in any way in this life. This was simply a mercy of God. And then I found myself as if I were, my cup were filled in this presence. My capacity had been reached. I found myself on the other side of this light and I could perceive now in a more physical sense a kingdom of light and I could see that there was a river running between from where I was and this wonderful kingdom of light and I could see that there were many people, it was populated by tremendous numbers of people and I knew each and every one of them intimately and I loved them all dearly and they were waiting for me and they were welcoming me and they were busy and they were working and they were learning and they were very much involved with, with us on this plane of existence and that plane of existence. And I was very happy to see this wonderful and beautiful welcoming home to me. And there was a man standing at the edge of this kingdom and he was welcoming me. Come home. And I began to be moved again by my love, by my excitement, by my joy and my rapture and my attraction for this kingdom. And as I moved to the edge of the river, the light spoke. The light itself spoke and said, it is not time. And this I understood absolutely in words. It was as if this was the word. And I froze. And I knew that I was simply pausing there as a mercy, as a buffer, as a protection for the shock that was to come. I knew that I was just being strengthened for the change. And then again, the light spoke. And with the second pronouncement, the word was the reality. 
and it said, it is not time. And with that, I was catapulted down a descending rainbow tunnel of light. And this I did indeed perceive to be a tunnel. And my soul was crying out with great terrible anguish and grief because I felt as if I were Eve being cast out of the Garden of Eden. I felt as if I were leaving the desire of all desires, the hope of all hopes, uh, the love of all loves. I was being cast away down this rainbow tunnel of light and there was a descending frequency of sound and tone and light, you know, down the rainbow spectrum and sentient also in intensity. So I was pulling away from the great source of love and attraction as I was being cast down. And then in a great horrible crash, I found myself arrogant like that, like a clap, way above my street and I could see that the body was now on a gurney and that they were moving the gurney to the ambulance and there were other beings that seemed to be hurting me like sheepdogs you know that were just kind of like protecting me and urging me back but that I couldn't get a clear focus on as individuals and they herded me back towards the body and I had no attraction to the body it was as if I had never existed in time and space and it was as if I could never relate to this physical realm of existence it was as if I were a complete alien and they herded me back towards the body and I sort of bumped up against the body as it was being moved into the back of the ambulance and I saw my mother getting in the front of the ambulance and she told my friends that to, where they were going and they were going to follow the ambulance to the hospital. And they closed up the back doors of the ambulance. There was a tenant in back with my body. And uh, they then proceeded to drive uh, what I know to be a 20 minute drive. Uh, again, this is something that was that was uh, timed for for 2020 when they went back and dug up the actual physical records of the fire department and whatnot. We t we went back and timed the drive. It was a 20 minute drive from from my house to uh, the hospital. And I followed the ambulance most of that time, not of any will of my own, but rather because there were these beings that rather sort of forced me to, to stay by the ambulance. They had a tremendous sense of humor, by the way. They, uh, <laughs> they were not without humor because I realized that, uh, uh, that I was, in essence, like Casper the ghost. I was a being <laughs> that had no body and that had no voice and that was just sort of like flying around. And, uh, and I was humored at this I wasn't laughing, I didn't have a body with which to laugh, but, and I remember commenting to them, well, is this, is this my punishment for being such a loud mouth in my life? I was a very outspoken teenager whenever I felt that uh, something unjust was being done, and I, my family used to call me Crusader Rabbit from a very early age because I was always crusading for something. But I said, is that my punishment? And this was a, a great cosmic joke. That, <laughs> uh, but I followed the ambulance, and, the, and then at one point in time, the, uh, the man in the back of the ambulance seemed to get a heartbeat for a moment, and my consciousness went dark. And then I popped out of the body again. And he looked in the, in the rear view mirror to the ambulance driver. And my mother was also looking in that mirror. And he went to him, DOA, DOA, because he was driving very fast down some mountainous roads. DOA, DOA. And I became my mother's pain at her see, hearing her daughter being pronounced dead, DOA, like that was my pain. I felt it as if it were, I were my own mother. 
and I felt it slice through her heart, her heart like a stiletto. And I bumped up with that out of the ambulance and I was very upset because I said, what do they know about life? They don't know about life. They don't know about death. I was alive and now I'm, you know, I felt that death was life and life was death. Anyway, I followed the ambulance to the hospital and they unloaded the gurney, wheeled it into the emergency. emergency room and the first doctor began to go to work on the body. I had no interest whatsoever in this because this doctor was exhausted. He had been up for many, many hours. He had been through an, uh, a horrible uh, uh, traffic accident, motorcycle accident, uh, several hours before. And he didn't care. He didn't care about me as an individual. So there was no connection of my consciousness to that room because he had no love for me, he had no, nothing in his heart for me. So I left and I went to my friends who were sitting in an ante room and I was now being a rather typical teenager and I was trying to tell them how wonderful it was and maybe it was going to be okay and maybe they weren't going to get me back and I was going to go on and I was going to be dead and it was just wonderful, I was free. And, uh, and I realized I could not communicate with them. And then I went to my mother, and I stayed above her head. She was outside some, some uh, yellow doors uh, facing the emergency room. And I prayed for her. I did all that I could to comfort my mother because I wanted her not to feel the pain in the grief and the sorrow. I wanted her to know that I loved her and that she loved me and that that was eternal. That was the only thing that truly existed beyond things that are composed and decomposed and break down. That was the true reality. And then my family physician came walking down the hallway in a tuxedo, came storming down the hall and crashed through the emergency room doors. He was a very feisty uh, 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 sort of country bumpkin doctor who uh, didn't take well to young patients dying whatsoever, any patient for that matter. And he crashed through the emergency room doors and he saw the body on the table and he saw the nurse calling the morgue and the doctor, the first doctor who was washing his hands at the sink and he looked at the body and he just screamed out, where the hell is she? Those are his words. And the young doctor turned around to him from the sink and he said she was DOA, down on arrival. And my doctor said, the hell she is. And, and with that, he went to the young nurse and he said, you keep bringing me the, the uh, you know, 100 cc's of adrenaline up to, up to six injections. I want you to just keep bringing them to me. And he ran over and he started injecting adrenaline and beating upon the heart. And I was terrified. I was horrified by this process. The resuscitation process is not beautiful. <laughs> it really isn't. And <clears throat> I was in the corner of the emergency room but I was very interested because my doctor cared about me. And uh, what happened then was at one point he stood up, the, uh, the young doctor came over and started arguing with him. He said, uh, what are you doing? He said, she was dead on arrival. She, was, she, she, she had to have been dead for, you know, 10, 15 minutes before they brought her in here. And he says, now you're going to try to... You're going to try to revive her? He says, don't you know, he says, don't you know that's dangerous? Meanwhile, my doctor is pounding and pounding on the heart. He says, uh, don't you know that could be dangerous? Don't you know she could have brain damage from this? And my doctor stopped pounding for a minute and stood up. He says, well, what the hell? She can't be in much worse shape than she is now. <laughs> It, 
and then he proceeded again to start pounding on the chest. And the, then the young doctor came over and started to help him, and the other nurse did too. And at that point in time, he wanted to, this is something, a medical procedure I had never heard of. He wanted to inject adrenaline into the heart, and he asked if there was a cardiologist on duty. And there wasn't. And then he let out a blue streak of swear words, cursing the hospital and whatnot. And he, he considered injecting adrenaline in the, into my heart, but he realized he had no knowledge of exactly how to do that. And he, and he was afraid that he would harm me. So he would decide he would try a, a couple more times and see what he could do with, uh, without doing that. And with the next injection of adrenaline, and the shocking and the beating. Um, he was successful in getting my spirit back into the body. To me, this was the greatest of all my fears, that he would be successful in reviving me because I wanted to go home. I wanted to go back to that light, which I knew to be my ultimate home. But again, in a, in, a, in, a, in a very dark and painful moment, my consciousness rejoined the body and I became physically unconscious. Well, some hours later, I came to in the, in the room in the hospital and I looked around and I could still see that everything was, was wrapped in sort of a blanket of, of, of loving light. And I looked around and I realized that, uh, that I was in the hospital and that they must have brought me back. And I moved my toes. I wanted to see if I could move my body. And I did. And I realized that I was physically alive. And I immediately began to consider suicide. I immediately felt that this was impossible. It was impossible. I had never heard of someone physically being dead and being brought back because in, at that point in time it was not something that was commonly known that, to occur. Not only was it physically impossible, but it was impossible for me to endure living in a world in which I knew that people hated each other, People were abusive to one another. People were always willing to, to put themselves over one another at the expense of another individual. We call it competition. Um, and, and I didn't see how I could exist in this world. I couldn't exist after having seen the light without the light. And I realized that I had no control over my limbs um, and, and that it would be impossible for me to commit suicide. And that suicide was really a betrayal of the love that I had felt, a betrayal of the love that had brought about all creation, me as an individual and each and every one of you, you know, are loved as in unique particular individuals and for that reason you were brought into existence and I could not deny that love. So I cried and cried. Sometime later my doctor came back into the into the room the next day. I my mother came in, she heard me crying and I told her I had been dead. She had heard me pronounce dead three times, so she was not going to argue with me at that point. <laughs> um, and that I had seen her brother. And the next day, the doctor came bursting into my room, and he started swearing at me. He said, what the hell did you do to yourself to, you know, why did you, you know, get so bad like that? And I said, well, what did you do to me? I started screaming back at him. He was quite shocked. You had no right to bring me back. I said, I was dead. You had no right to bring me back. 
absolutely no right to bring me back. And my doctor stood back and looked at me for a long minute. He knew that I had been pronounced dead. He, this was no surprise to him. But he stood and, and, and looked at me long and hard for a minute. And he moved forward to me and said, you weren't dead because you're not dead now. <laughs> and uh, 